Good morning. Welcome to the Rio Grande Basin Water Supply Forecast webinar. My name's Elizabeth Waite. I'm with NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System. For today's webinar, I'm really pleased to introduce Greg Waller, who is the Service Coordination Hydrologist for NOAA's National Weather Service West Gulf River Forecast Center. Wally received his Bachelor of Science degree in Meteorology from Texas A&M University in 1992. After working for a private firm in Houston for two years and for local national weather forecast offices for another five years, Wally transferred to the West Gulf River Forecast Center, where he has served the last 17 years as a hydrologist, a senior hydrometeorological anal analysis and support forecaster, and currently as service coordination hydrologist. Wally will share with us the current status and forecast for the region's water supplies. After his presentation, we'll open the webinar for your questions. Victor Murphy with NOAA's National Weather Service in the Southern Region will facilitate the Q&A. During the Q&A, we also have online two other regional ex experts available to respond to your questions. The first is Dave Dubois, New Mexico State Climatologist, and the second is Royce Fontenot, Senior Service Hydrologist for NOAA's National Weather Service based in Albuquerque. Throughout the entire webinar, participants are muted, so if you have a question, please type the question in the question box that's in the GoToWebinar control panel. You can also um, click on the little box to raise your hand and we will unmute you. Finally, today's webinar is being recorded. The webinar recording will be available on www.drought.gov. And before we begin, I want to thank the many individuals and organizations who put together and support this webinar series, including state climatologists in the region, NOAA's National Weather Service, and many others. Their willingness to take time to share their expertise and guide the content of these webinars is really invaluable to providing you with the most up-to-date information. So thank you to all of you. And now I will turn the presentation over to Wally. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, what I want to point out, uh, I'm very excited to talk to this group. I'm very excited to talk about this subject matter. And it's amazing what has changed just in the last two to three weeks as far as the messaging that I've been providing on uh, the spring hydrologic uh, water supply forecast for the Rio Grande Basin. Uh, my name is Greg Waller. You've heard me reference many times as Wally. Uh, there are a ton of Gregs in the National Weather Service, and this goes back to my college nickname. So if we ever meet on the streets, you call me Wally. That means I know you. we've met, and I know you're a friend. Um, the National Weather Service mission to provide weather, water, and climate data, forecasts, and warnings for the protection of life and property and the enhancement of the national economy. Basically, the National Weather Service wants to be your weather, water, and climate expert. And if we can't, we will know who to put you in touch with. Uh, at the National Weather Service River Forecast Center, I cannot do my job alone. I have to rely on partners to help with data. It's, there's so much information coming in. And it's from a national scale. You, know, you see the USGS, the Geologic Survey, you see FEMA on there. You see the Corps, Army Corps of Engineers icon. Uh, there's a Bureau of Rec in there. We go down to regional levels in the state of Texas, all the river authorities are their own kind of state agency. So I deal with individual river authorities in Texas. I deal with emergency management groups, uh, state of Texas, uh, or you know, it's in rare occasions in New Mexico. But the Rio Grande is an international border. And so you'll see that there's actually, you know, in the lower left, you see Canagua. We have international coordination. Uh, top in the middle, you see the, the International Boundary Water Commission. And then also we deal with the educational, you know, I am an Aggie, sometimes I'm forced to work with the University of Texas, but, you know, working with Prairie View A&M, University of Texas Arlington. Uh, and then the weather service itself, you know, I know that there's projects with New Mexico State uh, from the El Paso office and, and, and those types of examples of, of bringing in the education unit as well. Background, who am I and why am I here? That is actually a quote from the vice presidential debates of the 92 election from Admiral Stockdale, and I've just chuckled at it ever since. Uh, I'm with the National Weather Service West Gulf River Forecast Center. Uh, I am the service coordination hydrologist. Even though my degree is in meteorology, uh, I've spent enough time in the river forecast center world that I know the sciences. I would say I'm a jack of all trade, but a master of none. But I'm able to communicate these, and I'm really excited to provide uh, this forecast. 
we actually took a spring break vacation to Santa Fe just last week. This is me at the uh, the Overlook at White Rock at the Rio Grande. And so you, you're already seeing water in the river. That's good news. Well, I'm going to try to tell you there's more water coming. My area of responsibility, 402,000 square miles total. I mentioned that there's an international border, which means we have to work with multi-languages. And I don't mean Spanish and English, I mean metric and English units because all of our forecasts have to be done in the metric system for the Rio Grande partners. Uh, we get tropical storms, we get hurricanes here in Texas. Uh, North Texas, uh, well, in Texas in general, there's only one lake that's, that's natural. Every other lake is man-made, so the reservoir operations have to come into play. Uh, then you get over into New Mexico and Colorado, there are flood interests. And specifically when the monsoons get really active during wet years, but the primary driver for what we do in New Mexico and Colorado is snowpack and water supply. Uh, I've joked that uh, it's so critical that if I'm driving on the, the road and I pull over to pour out my Dr. Pepper, there's going to be someone wanting to know how much and where because they really need to know every drop of liquid in the area because that's how critical water supply is to the state. For us, our models, our driver, you know, we put meteorological inputs into our forecast, both the long-range extended forecast and our operational. But different agencies use different schemes. Some use only gauge, some use their own gauges only. From the National Weather Service, we use what's called QPE from MPE. There's a bunch of acronyms there. I will explain them. You know, the joke with NOAA, NOAA is the National Organization for the Advancement of Acronyms. Um, but with us, QPE, it is the quantitative precipitation estimate. It is what we think is the real rainfall that happened. It is a combination of gauges, radar, and in areas where radar doesn't cover, we have satellite. The GOES-R satellite that was launched a year and a half ago is giving us extremely accurate data that we have not had in my weather service career. So we feel that our QPE, our estimates of what has happened, is, will be more accurate. We get that from what's called MPE, the multi-sensor precipitation estimator. Think of all the data, all the satellite data, every rain gauge that we can get our hands on, all the radars across the United States. It takes a lot of computing power to overlay that data so that we can look at it. And we are trained to use this MPE program to generate the best product. We look at it every hour, three times, because we go back two hours every time we do it, or three, three hours every time we do it. And we'll do that for every hour of the day, 24 hours, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, where constantly have someone on the weather desk to look at the MPE data to try to give us our best estimate. Now, the kicker is the radars, specifically in northern New Mexico and southern Colorado, they can't shoot through mountain beams, through mountains very well. So, you know, we really rely on satellite and rain gauges to, to drive it. And you'll see gaps in the middle. I call it our chicken head. The Rio Grande looks like a chicken facing west. But we know there's a, uh, the, that there's a drier patch in between the mountain ranges, but we feel there's still precipitation in there that we're just not accurately capturing. And that's why the satellite data, specifically the new satellite data over the last year, year and a half, is really going to help us. All this is calculated on a four-kilometer, it's called ATRAP, Hydrologic Rainfall Analysis Project, but it's a four kilometer by four kilometer grid, and the 24 hour totals are available every day at water.weather.gov precip. You can download them, you can play with them, whatever. This is the water year to date from yesterday, and you can see the upslopes over in Wolf Creek Pass and, and you know, in southern New Mexico. You can see some higher mounts, uh, uh, I said southern New Mexico, southern Colorado. You can see some higher mounts in New Mexico, but you can see a gap. What it really shows up is when you, you look at the departure of normal, you know, the, the Rio Grande Basin stands out because of our precip estimates. The radars just don't do a good job, and we're working locally to try to improve that. Because we cannot rely 100% on the QPE uh, that generated in-house, we have to rely on everyone else. We rely very heavily on the NRCS. The data that they use is critical to go into our models. Okay, but we will also, any federal agency, Bureau of RAG, Land Management, Corps of Engineers, GS, USDA, will use their data, and then, you know, state-level data as well, you know, for, for Colorado, uh, any local interest. We work with our local weather service offices. Get us a good gauge data set to help us out with our precip estimates. 
when we generate a forecast, we generate seven days of future rainfall. How many of you made a joke about a meteorologist? Well, you can't get 30% tomorrow, right? What makes you think you can get seven days right? Our science is getting better. And for us, we will use seven days of future rainfall. It's pretty good. And then we'll use climatology. What is supposed to happen this time of year for forecast rainfall? To help us with snow and the melt factor, we'll do 10 days of forecast temperatures and then kick in climatology. I want those two points to kind of stick in the back of your mind so that when I give the briefings later on, you'll understand where there may be some wiggle room uh, in our water supply forecast for later on. Now, we will also use uh, the National Weather Service uh, Office of Hydrology and, and the Remote Sensing Group. They're trying to show how much snow water equivalent is, is on the ground right now. And you can see that, that we're over 20 to even 30 plus inches of snow water equivalent, trying to figure out the snowpack depth and how much water is in there. There's a lot uh, in Colorado, and there's a surprisingly lot, you know, from the, the you know, say Angel Fire in Las Vegas, New Mexico area. I was just in, you know, Santa Fe last week. We had seven inches of snow over two days in that area. The snowpack looks really, really good right along the mountain ranges. And even our remote sensing group is showing that, that maybe the Rio Grande Valley itself is dry, but there's a lot of snowpack available on the mountains. Like I said, we rely on the NRCS data. This is from yesterday. The black line is this year's data. The green line is what we should see according to average or median. The blue is the max we've ever seen. And you can go back and if you, this website, you can hit specific years and specific traces. What I want to point out since I took over this job, the snowpack last year, uh, I used the term brutal. Uh, from all the briefings I remember over the last 17 to 18 years, last year's snowpack was arguably the worst it's been since I've been in the River Forecast Center. Two years ago, that was one of the best snowpacks we've had. Well, because of the active pattern over the last two weeks, this year's snowpack will challenge and may exceed the one from two years ago. I mean, this is a really good snowpack. We're currently running, according to the snow tail data from the NRCS, we're running about 130 to 150% of normal, depending on the calculations, but let's just call it 130% normal snowpack for the median. That's really good news. We need it. But getting back to my story here, we take all the data we can and we put it into our model. CHIPS is a international forecasting, hydrologic forecasting model. We just upgraded to this in the you know, 2010, 2011 timeframe here at the National Weather Service. But this is the international gold standard when it comes to hydrologic modeling across the world. Our model, we will try to do upper zones and lower zones. And in this case, you know, we're, we're showing the, the graph over the last several months from the Rio Grande wagon wheel cap. And we have forecasters that daily go in and try to match our model and calibrate it to the snow that's on the ground, okay, the snow water equivalent. So it's good news. We do this daily. And then the future is off to the right of that pink line. So we'll let it go. And we'll see how well this stuff melts out. We can do it on a monthly basis, or you can see the daily fluctuations with daily rainfall. Okay, so yeah, what are, we have a dedicated hydrologist that goes in and, and is constantly looking at the soil moisture values and trying to, to, to tweak it. The goal is not to match the dailies. The goal is to match the monthly and the snow water equivalent and, and try to do that. But you will see trends in the daily data so that when we issue our model and issue our long range forecast that our model is trending. You know, the red line is the, is the, the lower and the blue line is the upper. And you can see a dotted line in there. That's the gauge data versus the model. We're doing a pretty good job of simulating the snow water equivalent in these, uh, in, in our chips model, our hydrologic model. And we do this when it starts snowing. Now, if it starts snowing in October, that's fine. But uh, if otherwise, we do it when it starts snowing, and we'll maintain this probably until early May uh, when the snow melt is completely out of the system, verifying the snow pack that's uh, from the gauges with our hydrologic model. What we want to talk about is our March 31st first forecast is going to be the most critical water supply forecast we issue because it's going to capture the entire remaining of the water year from April to September. 
if we followed up and did one on April 30th, it would should be a smaller amount because we should have seen some of the melt out. It would only be from April to September. If we do one at the end of April, you know, it'd be May to September. So, you know, each month that we go on, the follow-up forecast will only be from that point to September, and you should see our the water supply slowly, uh, slowly diminish. The numbers slowly diminish in our forecast. So, as I drove around the area, it was nice to see 1,500 cubic feet per second uh, coming out of some Rio Grande reservoirs. Um, this is, you know, yours truly there, but the kicker is in all hydrologic forecasting, you put precip on the ground, you have to find some way of estimating soil moisture. This is the calculated soil moisture uh, from uh, our, our national climate centers, and you can see that New Mexico, you know, there's green in New Mexico, you know, 200 millimeters of soil moisture, and you're like, okay, what does these random numbers do? It's wetter in the Mississippi Valley, and then it dries out as we go to the desert. Everyone knows that. Well, let's look at the, the anomalies. And you can see that, you know, Texas seems to be wetter than normal, but in New Mexico, there's a small blob right down the center where the Rio Grande Basin uh, leaves Albuquerque and goes towards, you know, the El Paso area. But think about it. Most of the state of New Mexico is normal according to the soil moisture calculations. After last year's just really horrible drought, how much precip has had to fall to catch us up and bring us up to normal. That's something you need to keep in your back pocket when you're making a forecast. Another way to look at it from uh, the NASA group is look up in northern New Mexico, the 10 to 40 centimeter uh, soil moisture value, and then the one, the zero to 100 centimeter soil moisture value. It, the graph on the left shows a lot more blues and greens, which means the top layers are getting some soil moisture in them. They're getting saturated, but it, it's not showing up as much when you go down to deeper levels. So that shows you how bad last year's drought was and then how much rain we've had this entire fall, this entire winter, and then the last couple of weeks is starting to do its job of saturating the soil at the top layers. And we're going to see if this really works its way down to, to saturate some of the deeper layers as well. Okay. What we have noticed, our data, and we're in coordination uh, with uh, the drought folks from each state, uh, and who determines the drought declarations, look at October 2nd when the water year started. Uh, D3 and D4, extreme and exceptional drought all in the Rio Grande Basin. And if I went outside and did the New Mexico area, you'd see widespread maroons and reds. Uh, but just focusing on the Rio Grande and how much snow and precipitation we've had, so that the one that was issued just last week, the exceptional drought is gone. There's pockets of extreme drought, and we'll see if there's any long-term improvement on that. But, you know, in the upper portions of Colorado, it's gone, you know, moderate drought, and even to some areas it's improved to just abnormally dry. We've had a very, very good winter and early spring to help out, to, to help the drought improvements. And it reflects all the way down through the state of New Mexico. I've circled the, the, the headwaters of the Rio Grande, but if you look across New Mexico, significant drought improvement across the entire western area due to the favorable patterns that we've had this year. This is a graphic from the NRCS. This is how much snow packed that they're expecting by month. So the blues would be October. The small little amount of red would be November. Small little amount of green was December. But you can see we really started getting active in January in the purple. Blue is February. And the, the orange, uh, that's March. You can see that February and March snowpack have shot past, and the axis on the left is percent of normal. We have shot past, you know, from... 45 to 50 percent in two months, we've shot past it, you know, like I said, 130 percent of normal. And I've drawn an error to compare last year's 2018 was really, really bad and really, really low. And in a really good year of 2017, well, we're exceeding 2017 at this point, and there's more precipitation in the forecast. So it's good news for the volume. Now the problem is, is are there going to be other issues at play with how much water is going to come off and is it going to cause flood problems? So that's where the National Weather Service offices get into the, the river forecasting and, and the flood products as well. So we'll go from a water supply to a river monitoring and flood process here, probably in the next two or three weeks, just to keep an eye on how fast the snow melts out. Our official snow water supply numbers are available at this site. It's a text product that goes back decades. It shows, you know, the 50%, the 30%, the maximum. You know, what does that compare to the 30-year average? And really, text, come on, man, this is 2019. 
So we have worked with our partners over in Salt Lake at the CBRC uh, to, to include our products for the Rio Grande into their, their products uh, suite of, of you know, water equivalent and snow water supply and that kind of stuff. It is available at this website. It's a long one, but it, the website will be available. What I want to point out is if you zoom in to the Rio Grande, you'll see that the last time we issued forecast, there are some, some greens in there that's around normal. Some reds that are still dry, but there's some blues popping up that are above normal in the Rio Grande Basin. When we regenerate these forecasts, I imagine there's going to be a lot more blues, and you know who knows if there's going to be a purple involved as well. That would show that we're 100%, 120%, or if it's the purple, 150% of, of normal than what we expect in, in the, the water supply forecast. So this data is available to drill in, dive in, and look at the individual points. What I want to talk about is we mentioned we use climatology, okay? So what about the next month? Well, we're looking for above normal temperatures, not necessarily a good thing, but we're looking at above normal precipitation or the chances for above normal precipitation in the upper Rio Grande and the, the entire northern half of New Mexico. So we're using climatology. Well, what if we come in with a little bit more precipitation than expected? Then our water supply numbers, our forecasts are low, and they'll need to be bumped up a little bit with updates. What if we do a three-month time frame? Well, the temperature signals go away. There's an equal chance of below, an equal chance of normal, and an equal chance of above normal for temperatures. That's on the right. But if you look on the left, we are still showing the signal for above normal precipitation or better chances for above normal precipitation for all of New Mexico and Southern Colorado. So we use climatology, but we, I've just shown you a one month and a three month uh, prediction from the Climate Prediction Center that says there's a chance there's going to be more than climatology uh, during the entire three month time frame. Okay, all this is based in on El Nino. We have an El Nino advisory in effect. And the signal looks strong all the way through. The, the bottom uh, axis is the three-month time frame, MAM, March, April, May, AMJ, April, May, June. And our signal for uh, El Nino goes all the way through the end of the summer. And so uh, we'll see here how well uh, the El Nino verifies. I do know from local studies that El Nino and these long-range CPC forecasts do show skill uh, in Texas and New Mexico. And it shows skill when we transition from one into the other. So I'll be really interested to see how much, you know, how much the precipitation forecast is over the next three months. But Victor Murphy from the southern region threw out, he goes, let's look at other factors as well. You know, factor in the, the Madden-Julian oscillation, other large-scale anomalies, and they are coming in on top of the climate model that's also showing New Mexico is going to be above normal. Uh, you know, this is for the April, May, and June time frame as well. So almost every long-range climate predictor we have shows a good chance of above normal precipitation on top of the good snowpack. So as we zoom in, you can see that's a handsome feller at the Rio Grande there. The, the stats are we're about 135 percent of normal as of yesterday. Uh, it's in one of the top percentiles of all the years we've had. This snowpack is probably going to get a little bit better, you know, just from looking at the short-range forecast. What I want to highlight, 2018 was bad. I use the term brutal. You've got to saturate the soil. So just because you have 150% of snowpack doesn't mean you're going to have 150% normal, above normal water supply. A lot of that's got to go and saturate the soil levels. And I showed you the top layers are starting to moisten up. We're going to see how deep you know that moisture works down. Regardless, we're going to see uh, the, uh, an above normal water supply year. The question now is how much? How much does the snow, you know, when it melts, does it melt at a, at a nice, you know, manageable fraction or does it melt all at once and cause possible localized flood issues? Uh, and then there's other things that, that, that could factor in that could go wrong. Um, what I fear is what if we have more rain on top of the snow, a warm rain on top of the snow? We will see more runoff. And that's something the National Weather Service forecasters are really going to look at. Um, the other problem is, it's happened before, if we have a pattern change, if we go southwest winds, they're dry. That snowpack's just going to sublimate off. It just means that it goes no runoff, it goes directly from ice into vapor, and we don't see the water supply you know, component of it. 
everything we do is snow on the ground, snow on the ground, snow on the ground, and we're making the assumption that it will run off in a behave pattern. Sometimes Mother Nature will do that and, and throw us that curveball. This is the two areas where we could go wrong. The precipitation pattern strays far from climatology, or we have very warm and dry winds and sublimate the snowpack. Either way, we will be issuing forecasts. We'll make sure the Pueblo office, the Albuquerque Weather Service office, we're gonna make sure they have the latest in their hands to brief on any questions. With that, this is my last slide. Uh, I will be available for any questions, and if it's outside of my realm, then I will kick it over to the other experts. But uh, back to you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Wally. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Victor to lead the question and answer. So, um, Victor, please go ahead. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so, if anyone has a question at all, right now I still have everyone muted, but just uh, you can click on the icon, the question mark icon, or the raise your hand icon, and um, I will go ahead and unmute you. You can ask your questions. So, while people are thinking of questions, if I, I had a quick question for, for Greg. Um, I think it was slide number 18, the one, or may, may have been 19 or so, the one with the uh, Colorado Basin forecast, uh, we zoomed in on the, uh, that one right there. Yeah, um, the one on the right, uh, what what uh, what date was this forecast made here? I mean, it shows, uh, you know, I'm looking outside of Rio Grande, I'm looking more in, say, southwest of Mexico, I see nothing but blues, so obviously they're doing really, really well there. I know that's the, uh, the Salt Lake City RFC, but for your area or our area, the Rio Grande, when, when was this forecast made? You our know? forecast our forecast that you're seeing here was based on the 6th of March. And since oh, then, okay. we've had a, a ton of snowfall. So these, I expect these colors to, to cool down a lot, to go into a lot of blues and stuff like that. Uh, the Salt Lake RFC, they run theirs a little more frequently. And the same with the uh, CN, which is California, Nevada. So if you go all the way over the Pacific Ocean, you see a lot of blues there. You know, there's been a lot of flooding issues. Uh, ours issued on March 6th when we issued the one on the, around the 31st or so, uh, and it'll go out the first week of April. Uh, you should see these these dots improve significantly. Okay, so the forecast uh, for the Rio Grande here was made on the 6th of March, is about two weeks ago. And uh, I'm going to ask Royce a quick question, being Royce Fontenot is the uh, senior service hydrologist at our forecast office in Albuquerque. So in the last two weeks, Roy, since this forecast was made, um, well, I think as Wally alluded to, bottom line, it's been pretty continued wet, continued, I think, snowy. So if anything, uh, this should improve uh, when the next forecast is made, correct? Yeah, hi, this is Rose Fontenot here at Albuquerque. Yeah, it should. We're going to continue, you know, the pattern's remaining active. So we're going to continue to see that snowpack build um, all the way up through the, you know, the northern New Mexico into uh, southern Colorado. So uh, as Wally alluded to, you know, that that um, we do have concerns about soil moisture. So just because you're well above normal on snowpack doesn't necessarily mean you can be above normal on runoff. Uh, so, but we are starting to pay attention to how that may come off. Um, and certainly something locally here in New Mexico we can work with uh, the state and our emergency managers to address as a guideline. Okay, thank you, Royce. Okay, um, I don't see any questions from anyone. Uh, like I said, if you have a question, just simply uh, click on the question icon or the you know, raise your hand. Um, do have a question here from uh, Mike Anderson. Let me go ahead and unmute you, Mike, so you can go ahead and ask your question. Uh, bear with me here. Uh, go ahead, Mike. You're, Mike, you're unmuted, so you go to ask your question. Okay, so Mike's question is, uh, can this presentation be found later to pass along to colleagues? Absolutely. Elizabeth, you want to address that as far as, um, you know, how uh, attendees can get access to the presentation, the, you know, both the slides and the uh, the, uh, audio? Sure. Um, I will switch the screen over to mine. It's www.drought.gov. We will put it online. And um, I will also send out to all attendees of this webinar, I'll send out the, the link 
an invitation to the link where you can access it directly on drought.gov. The link is also right here on your screen, webinar recording, www.drought.gov. Okay, very good. Thank you, Elizabeth. A um, couple other questions here. Let me see. Natalia Navarro. Uh, Natalia, I've unmuted you. Uh, go ahead and ask a question. Yeah. All right. Okay, Natalia, uh, you have the floor if you want to ask your question. Okay, don't say anything there. Um, Nate Dampier, you have a question. I'm going to unmute you. Uh, Nate, go ahead. Stupid piece of crap. Okay. Uh, looks like Nate dropped off the call. So I'll go back to Natalia again, see if you have a question. I don't know if I can. Can you hear me? I can barely hear you. Okay, sorry. I don't have a headset. I'm wondering what the El Nino advisory means. Um, I'll go ahead and answer that. So the the uh, the Climate Prediction Center, the NOAA Climate Prediction Center, uh, monitors the sea surface temperatures along the Pacific Ocean. Uh, uh, along the equator, um, you know, daily, and um, whenever El Nino conditions are occurring and uh, forecast to continue to occur, they issue what's called El Nino advisory. And and what that means is that I believe they just issued about a month ago. Uh, the actually the sea surface temperatures along the equatorial Pacific have been at or above the 0 0.5 degrees Celsius uh, value which in and of itself, just, just those numbers would mean that, hey, we're in a weak El Nino because it's the sea surface temperature anomalies along the equator uh, in the Pacific Ocean are warmer than 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. But there has not been a coupling with the atmosphere. In other words, the atmospheric response to those warmer waters uh, have not occurred up until a month ago. So about a month ago or six weeks ago, we saw the atmospheric coupling take place or the atmospheric response uh, in regard to those warmer than normal temperatures along the equator, um, the atmospheric response has kicked in. And so th that's what prompted them to upgrade um, this to an El Nino advisory. And as uh, Wally pointed out, that should, the El Nino is expected to last 60% uh, probability it should last through the summertime. Um, and so we'll see, uh, actually it's been, strengthening here the last couple three weeks or so so we may have this thing uh, actually into uh uh later on this calendar year and as wally also pointed out in general uh it's good news for well if you want precipitation that's good news for the state of texas and new mexico because the southern tier of the u.s has a very good uh linkage a very strong relationship between el nino and above normal precipitation so uh the fact that we have the El Nino advisory, the fact that we have El Nino conditions right now, uh, both of those are good news uh, for uh, drought mitigation or drought relief. So Natalia, I'll bring it back to you. Did it, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions at all. So. Um, uh, I take that back. Dave Osborne's got a question. Dave, go ahead. Uh, Dave, okay, apparently not. So Elizabeth, I don't see anything else. Dave did type a question in the question box. If you had to identify flood risk in the upper Rio Grande Valley, would you estimate this region to be at low, moderate, or high risk this year with current conditions? But right now, because we were so dry last year, and the amounts we're looking at, it's low. It's, it's not a, I mean, it's not zero. It's low, 
but I have to put the caveat, if we see more rain coming in or we see more snow, we may have to bump it up. So Greg Waller on, you know, March the 19th, I'm saying it's a low risk for that area, uh, but we need to watch the precip over the next several weeks to a month to, to see if we need to raise that. Okay, thanks, Greg. Uh, so there's another question here. Um, you see, Roy, this might be more in your wheelhouse. Um, it's important to note that we have two of Colorado's largest wildland burn scars uh, in the noted counties, which is San Luis Valley region, uh, which increases vulnerability for flash flooding. Um, so David, David has no microphone, unfortunately, but that's his question, I guess, tying in the uh, forecasts and current conditions, et cetera, with the uh, with these wildfire burn scars. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, and kind of tying back to Wally's question, I think one thing we have to remember is the main stem Rio Grande um, tends to not flood as much. Um, I think right now, at least on, on my side of, of the Rio Grande, you know, as you, you come south of the border, my, my immediate concern is um, the tributaries. So certainly we're going to watch. Um, you know, normally we don't have a, a high flood risk on the main stem Rio Grande, but I, I think certainly the tributaries. As far as burn scars, you get a few different factors there. Certainly, um, you know, when you're dealing with snow runoff, you have a little bit different of a uh, situation there versus, uh, for example, we're typically used to the, the really rapid um, quick runoff when we have a uh, thunderstorm going over a burn scar. Uh, with snow melt, it's more gradual. So uh, there's certainly some factors there on those individual burn scars in those individual areas. Uh, going through, we're coming up on the what we call the spring barrier, uh, predictive-wise. So looking at how monsoon season right now, I talked to our, our local climate guru here at the forecast office, and you know we'll have a little better idea on what monsoon's going to look like, which is certainly typically our, our greater threat to burn scars uh, is that, that thunderstorm activity in the summer. So we're going to have a little bit better idea come probably late April, early May, as we're out of this, what we call the spring barrier, which is when we really don't have a great predictive time frame because you know spring's a transition season so certainly there's going to be that convective threat we you know we've got a lot of burn scars in southern colorado and uh, northern new mexico i'm thinking 416 ute park um, in particular so uh, we're gonna have to monitor those um, as we go through um, but there's there's kind of a two different factors there but uh, certainly the the uh, high snowpack uh, runoff can cause some problems as well along the burn scars Thank you, Royce. Um, okay, I think we've pretty much answered all the questions that I'm seeing <clears throat> here on the screen. Um, so unless anyone else has any last second questions, uh, I think, uh, Elizabeth, I will hand it over back to you um, so as you can let everyone know how they can get access to the presentation um, and various links, websites, et cetera. Thank you, Victor. Um, so the on your screen is the uh, website www.drought.gov for the webinar recording. You're also welcome to contact me, elizabeth.wait at noaa.gov if you want the individual slides or to be put in contact with any of the experts who've been online today. So I want to thank Wally for your excellent presentation and thank you, Victor, for um, handling the Q&A and thanks Dave and Royce for being online and available for answering questions. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye.